Nathan Cavallari, welcome to Australian Musician. Thank you, mate. Uh, yeah, I appreciate you having me. So where have you been spending your COVID lockdown and how have you been co coping with it? Um, two locations. I've been spending it at home and then, yeah, my creative pad, which is here. So, um, and yeah, so I, I'm, I'm pretty blessed that I have two um, pretty awesome environments to spend this time. And, um, you know, this year um, on the overall has been um, quite strange because obviously there, there are challenges uh, like many of us are having, particularly in music. But then there's been lots of big wins for me and scores that um that I haven't had since I was a kid. So yeah, um yeah, it's definitely quite an up and down uh, year. But I'm just you know doing my best to just keep um, focused on what I can control and and letting go of what I can't. So yeah, uh, you've got a new album called Demons coming out on August six. Uh, twenty six yeah. twenty six years since your last solo album. Um, yeah. When really you were just a kid. Does it feel like your first real album? Um, it does because, um, I mean, those the albums that I did as a solo artist when I was a kid, uh, they, my connection with them was musical. It's, you know, it was the guitar, it was the chords, and lyrics were just kind of a secondary. Um, and, and also I wasn't singing um, at the time. So... Um, this one feels different because it, it's there's so many aspects to it and, and um, my emotional investment uh, feels like a lot deeper um, as well. Even though not all the songs are deep, there are still some playful songs there. But um, And also it was written at a time where I wasn't intending on uh, returning to music during uh, some darker times that I had. So it was like the creative process um, was uncorrupted. Um, by career uh, goals and stuff that can kind of weave their way into the um, the creative process because it was just literally a time of self-expression for me, which kind of reminded me of how I, I used to write when I was a kid. Yeah. Let's yeah. talk a little bit about uh, those days when you were a kid and, um, yeah. and before you were a teenager, you'd jam with Booker T, the MGs, BB King, Deep Purple, mm -hmm. Uh, you'd met Mark Knopfler, played at the opening ceremony of the Olympic Games, uh, been on TV shows in America, been in movies. <laughs> in your mind, did you think that lifestyle would just go on and on? Um, I mean, I, I, I hope, like, I mean, it's hard to say. I didn't really think too much ahead. I just knew that as, as it was growing, it, it was showing me what I wanted. You know, I really wanted to get to a point where I was playing to massive crowds and around the world. But at the same time, we were we were getting quite exhausted. Mm -hmm. It was a big two, three, I remember, it was probably about four years that were just huge. They were between the age of eight, uh, yeah, probably eight or nine and um, 13 years old, um, which is when I was backwards and forwards from the States. I was on TV all the time. I was touring with BB King I'd um, in that small amount of time. I'd done two albums, one under Michael Jackson's label. I was working on another one, which didn't end up getting released. Um, so yeah, we were, we were getting tired. And I think part of the reason why my parents decided to, to pull me back, um, at around age 16 was because they, they didn't want me in a state, constant state of reaction. They wanted to make sure that um, give me the opportunity and the space to be able to decide on what I wanted to do and what type of future I wanted, um, which I'm really glad that they did because when I did take that that first step away um, from being an artist, it allowed me to focus more on my songwriting um, and the production side as well, which all of that is, you know, um, is a part of what I do now. Yeah. Do you remember the conversations with people like B.B. King and the lessons that they were giving you? Um, yeah, I mean, it was hard because um, the as a kid, I I was so young, so it's not like we had much in common to talk mm. about. But, I mean, this all sounds very cliche, but I remember B.B. King, and this ended up being featured on the, the commercial we did together. Um, he, um, it was on authenticity just making sure that I'm, I am being myself. And I remember him just saying, just be you, whatever you do, be you. And I didn't even, I didn't know what that meant at that time. Like, you know, I'm 12 years old, I'm going to be me. 
who are also mine. Like it's, you know, um, but that advice would pop up here and there. It's obviously really got to me, my subconscious because during times where I was confused creatively or even in life, um, those words would surface and give me a lot of clarity and strength. Um, but most of the advice I got during that time was musical as well and also observational um, just through watching them do what they do. Like I'd never seen BB, um, I'd never seen blues on the big stage until I watched BB King and I toured with him to just see the power that that has. I had only witnessed it in small clubs. Um, same thing with Jimmy and Diesel. Uh, what I learned from watching them was, uh, yeah, you, you can be a, a musician, you know, and at that time I'd only, I, I was busking and then boom, I'm on stage in front of 10,000 people um, and watching them do what they do um, showed me the importance of connecting, you know, not just playing, but connecting with your audience. Um, and that really inspired me. Uh, so yeah, I, I learned a lot mainly from watching these guys. And then it wasn't until probably later in life, um, with some of my close friends like Diesel, um, was I able to, um, connect with them more on a personal level, um, and, you know, get advice during times when I really, really needed it. Yeah. Um, yeah. You did uh, perform with a couple of bands, um, yeah. and in, in between the the solo albums, um, were you reluctant uh, going into the solo project this time around? No, I felt it felt right. I mean, I was I was I was reluctant for different reasons. I was reluctant because I because I just come out of a, a, a pretty full on depression and chronic fatigue and stuff like that. I was I was wondering whether I had the capacity to to tour and perform. And when they were during that time, I'd, I'd shut down so many areas of my life that I, um, I it really took a long time to build up my confidence and, and um, take those steps back out there again. Um, so that was more the, the hesitation. As far as creatively, it's I've never been so sure and connected to something. It's um, It feels like it really is like – all of me, whereas my previous bands, Nat Cole and the Kings, was a, was a good part of me, but it, 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 it came from just a certain place. And I feel like there was a lot of, um, strangely, a lot of, well, not shame, but maybe a bit of embarrassment. I just didn't, I didn't see myself, my name as being credible. Um, and, you know, thanks to a lot of artists, friends that I have that tell it how it is that I look up to, I received an education on that. <laughs> yeah. And that's what made me think, well, where, why am I burying the past for? Because that's what I did. I mean, that's the downside of going through all that stuff when, when you're at school, it's yeah. like I was on TV while I was at school. It's not, it's not a, the nicest environment to be the center of attention, you know? Um, so I was able to kind of face a lot of those demons and, and I'm glad I did because it, it feels quite liberating to go out there as a solo artist again. Yeah. All the interviews I have seen with you recently, you really do seem to be in a good space and, um, your new single before you check out, you're in a position to be able to, um, step out of, uh, the darkness and, and yeah. look at situations, uh, such as the subject matter of, uh, before you check out, mm. um, there's a lot of musicians out there doing it tough at the moment. They're alone with their thoughts, yeah. um, out of work. What kind of things have you learned to, to keep the darkness at bay? Um, yeah, I mean, and I've often, when I've come across this question, it's, um, there's so many ways I can answer it. Um, but one thing I keep coming back to is about just examining your perception of adversity. Like it's, Whenever I've been in a situation where I've seen, you know, if I've had to face something that's undesirable um, and if I've had a battle mentality with it, um, it just grows. It just it, it really feels like me versus the world. Um, but if I can – but the times that I've, start, I've, I've, you know, had more of the outlook of – and I suppose it comes with a certain sense of faith that there's something in this that's going to make me stronger. There's something in this that that is going to, to, to help guide me towards where I need to be. Um, then it becomes more like a puzzle. 
And it's not like I'm in the darkness. It's more, well, it's like going to the gym and lifting weights, you know, it kind of hurts, but it makes you stronger. So um, just examining your perception of adversity um, is has really helped me. Um, and because there's so many takeaways, there's so many takeaways, you know, if we're focused on, on the, um, the negatives, um, that's not an accurate, um, uh, picture of what actually is happening. There are negatives, but there are also positives and there, and it's okay. Like I think demonizing, um, undesirable feelings got me into trouble a lot as well. You know, it's okay to feel sad, you know, by being sad means you can digest it and be, be, you know, and move on from it. Um, it's as soon as we start to resist what is actually happening, it just, it sticks around and it grows and it eats you up. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty fundamental advice, but that's, that's what's really helped me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's talk about some fun stuff. Uh, yeah. the, the gear that you used on your album, um, the single is Before You Check Out. It's got a beautiful mm. um, uh, finger-picking guitar in the background. What, yeah, yeah. What's what's the guitar? Um, I'll grab it. Do you want me to grab sure. it? Sure. Yeah. Is that um, the so this was um, – this is actually not mine. This is – I'm lucky enough that my guitarist, Kenny – lent it to me and it's an old thirties harmony. Um, that was his granddad's he's, um, who passed away quite a while ago. Um, so it's, you know, it's, I don't know if you can hear that, but, and it's, um, I love it because it's like this wooden bridge kind of makes it sound really well woody. Like that's where you get that earthiness and in, in, here it doesn't sound like it's got much body and it's obviously doesn't compare to a big, you know, big open acoustic or whatever. But um, when I played that part on a normal acoustic, it just didn't do it for me. It just sounded too, I don't know, normal, a bit, a bit vanilla. But as soon as I played it on this, I thought, oh, that's where we want to be. So that's, um, that's yeah, that's the harmony. So did you have a like a, a sonic vision for the album or was it just a matter of uh, getting a bunch of your – new songs out there um no i did i did um because this album had come uh, together over quite a long period of time um i did have time to just to you know experiment a little bit when it came to um within the pre-production process um i knew what i didn't want like i i um, to start with which was i didn't want to just make an album where it feels like a bunch of guys are in a room a band and it's raw and it's just, and we're just playing. Um, a lot of these songs could just sound like pretty standard um, blues funk songs. I really wanted there to be a, a modern, I wanted to take what I love about the vintage world, like the retro world, and then what I love about the modern world and bring it together. Um, so for songs like 29 Gold Stars and Boho Limousine, um, I could have just played a, just a typical funk groove over the top, but instead I want, I, I sort of channeled some of my, uh, R and B and hip hop influences to just, just make it a little bit more hybrid. Um, I love all the sort of JJ Kale, um, you know, understated, just really, really cool. I love the, the sort of fuzzy, um, sounds, the trems and phases and, um, you know, I think most of my influences are subconscious. They're not too literal. Like if you listen to it, you, they may pop up or it may give you the feeling of it, but it's not, um, you know, it's it's just such a, a mashup of all my favourite um, favorite artists and productions. Yeah. And what about the electric guitars that you used? Electric guitars? Um, I used a fair few, but the main one, um, so... This is my main one at the at the moment, um, and I played this a lot in my old band as well. So this is a mid '80s 335 um, that was stolen, and I actually got it back. So um, it wants to be with me. Um, so that was that was used a fair bit. We got um, so this is the Fernandez. This is the one that Martin Offler gave me that made an appearance on the um, on the album a couple of times. Uh, I had. Um, I only th I thought that he had this sent from the factory, but I posted it online, and a Martin Offler memorabilia guy 
um, notice there's a sort of a stain around on the frets, a couple of the frets. And he said, if you look at um, photos of Mark from the Love Over Gold stuff, it, it's he's actually holding this. So this came from his personal connect collection, which um, means something else now. Yeah. Um, and then we've got... Um, that's the 62 Strat, and that's the one that um, Robin Ford sold me. Okay. Um, in in the mid 90s, so he was on he he featured on the album that we didn't end up releasing. Um, so this definitely makes a, a couple appearances. And then I had um, I borrowed um, Diesel had like an an old uh, Harmony Rocket, uh, which was really cool for that sort of woody electric sort of sound. Um, and, uh, yeah, so we used a few, few different ones, Les Pauls, um, uh, yeah, but my, my main one was the, the Gibson 335, so. That was used all the time. Like that friend of Princeton, um, he's just sensational. It's a, it, I think it's a 64, I believe, 63 or 64. Um, I use it on so much. Like, um, yeah, pretty much most of, most of the guitars you'll hear have been run through the Fender Princeton, or they've been, uh, or they're they're literally DI. I really like DI guitar sounds where I drive the preamp that I'm using, um, and then sometimes I'll couple it up with a reamping by going through the Princeton, but print, the Princeton was my main, definitely my main amp on, on this one. Yeah, and you use a radial um, reamper? Yep, I do, yep, that, that, that blue one. Definitely notice the difference um, <laughs> when, I, when I'm reamping. So I, I actually, because I'm doing it all myself, I actually prefer to record everything DI um, first so that I don't have to be into, you know, my mind doesn't have to be too divided into trying to pull a sound at the same time as being in performance mode. I really want it to keep those separate. It's only occasionally where I feel like the performance relies on on me actually having the sound and being in the room with the amp um, will I, you know, try and do it at the same time. But most of what you're hearing is literally DI first and then I'll, I'll re-amp when I'm in sound pulling mode. Yeah. Um- yeah. You've got some uh, gigs lined up uh, in October, which uh, we'll see what happens with the, the COVID situation, but uh, all going well. Uh, what will the stage rig consist of? The stage, it's an intimate um, show. And when I say intimate, it's not, I mean, it gets pretty loud and cranking and it is actually electric, but it's, um, so myself, my guitar player, and sometimes we have a trumpet player. Uh, as well. So I use a Fender Deluxe, a reissue. Um, and then on the floor, I have uh, a trigger for my SPD. So I, I trigger some beat samples, just some simple ones. Um, and Kenny uses like a stomp board, which is um, this one. It's called, uh, I forget who makes it. It's a guy up towards Maitland, Newcastle. Uh, Peterman. Yeah, that's right. So this is fantastic because it it doesn't work like a piezo. Um, it's got this type of technology that's it's almost like there's a coin in it, and when you hit it, it resonates bottom end. So it's not bottom end; you actually have to dial in, um, which is really cool. It sounds huge. I love it. So he's um, he uses that for some of the more simple tracks. Um, I, yeah, my main guitar is definitely still the 335. I'm, I'm working on trying to get comfortable with a jazz master. That's a that's a, an area that I really want to dive into. I haven't quite found the the um, the exact one that I want, um, but I imagine that soon will be my my. I'll go between the 335 and the jazz master. Um, but for now, it ends up being my 66 um, SG um, as a second guitar. And, um, yeah, on some of the bigger stages, I just um, make sure I've got um, two fenders. <laughs> um, and he uses a, an old 70s uh, music man. Okay. Um, Peter Green, the original uh, Fleetwood Mac 
guitarist uh, passed away on the weekend. Is that a guitarist that you've come across at all in your you travels? You know, I was pretty late to the Peter Green um, party. Um, it's Kenny, my guitarist, was the one who introduced me to Peter Green. And, um, and, and I'm embarrassed to say that because I played with Fleetwood Mac um, in, um, in the very early 90s. Um, and uh, I just didn't realize until much later how filthy blues they were. And, um, you know, just it, it really blew me away, particularly over the, yeah, the last 10 years I was introduced to his work. And, um, I mean, we do one of the songs we do on stage where Kenny, I hand the mic over to Kenny, his heart beat like a hammer, um, which is, yeah, just sensational. I mean, that Texas shuffle that uh, Mick Fleetwood does is just... <laughs> So good. So, yeah, it was very, very sad news. Yeah. Um, once all this lockdown business is totally over, uh, what are you looking forward to most? Oh, just just touring freely and just being social. Like I – right now I'm, I'm getting a lot out of performing on um, a platform called Twitch. That's where I do my performances. And I also um, – it is sort of a bit of a hang. Most of the streams go for about – probably three hours where I'll also, you know, on top of playing my songs, I'll then jump on the kid or the bass or whatever. And I'll actually create a jam because everything's running through routed through pro tools and I can do screen share so can people can see what I'm doing mix wise. And uh, so that's been fun. That's, that's really, um, you know, uh, attempted to fill that void. Um, but yeah, I really, I really do miss meeting new people, put my arms around them. I'm a hugger. And, um, yeah, it'd be good to be touring, um, without having to be cautious. So, um, you know, hopefully that happens sooner rather than later, but we'll see, we'll see what happens. But I mean, I think the, I've got gigs booked all the way from October to, um, the start of December. So, um, I am hopeful that some of those, um, will, will go ahead. So if not all of them, but we'll see. Okay. So the album's out, uh, it's Demons. It's out on August 6th. Uh, yeah. Nathan Cavallari, it's been great to catch up with you. Yeah, thanks for your time, mate. Appreciate it.